and the public consultation on the National Agri-Food Strategy remains open until June. So just go to gov.ie forward slash consultations. And now by the magic of science, we have uh, our new panel in place for you. So please let me introduce them. And Dr. Maeve Henshin is Principal Research Officer with Chagas. She's here in a personal capacity today. She's on the board of the Food Safety Authority and on the executive of BioOrbic, Ireland's bioeconomy research centre. She's also involved with the SCAR Food Systems Working Group. Her interests are innovation in the circular bioeconomy and sustainable food systems. Joining us remotely, Dr. Nora Caldi is founder and CEO of Neuritas, which uses technology to get the most from nature. Their aim is new discoveries that could benefit the lives and health of billions of people globally. Alvin Hunt is the co-founder and chief executive of Hexafly, and Irish Agritech. His mission to revolutionise the way we feed this world by breeding insects on an industrial scale and doing that sustainably as well. And Professor O'Connor is the director of BioOrbic, the Science Foundation Ireland BioOrbic, uh, Bioeconomy Research Centre at UCD. He's also set up two companies, Bioplastec and Nova Mentis. So a huge amount of brain power on this panel uh, and you're all very welcome. Um, and Maeve, maybe you'd kick us off with this question of the appliance of science and this brave new word of, world of uh, food that's coming to us. And, you know, we know the strategy, we know what we're all trying to achieve and we want it to be circular, we want it to be sustainable, we want it to be affordable, accessible, ethical. How close are we to doing all that and what do we need to be focusing on in your view? Um, well, I suppose, yeah, there's, there's a lot we're asking from, for, yeah. from the system there. And um, I suppose I don't really want to throw cold water on things from the outset, but I suppose the important thing to recognise that absolutely science and technology has brought us a huge way. Uh, we're producing a lot more milk, say, with less inputs and less environmental impact than in the past. We have fantastic developments with new technologies around um, adding value to co-processing and waste streams but I think we have to recognize that science and technology can only bring us some of the way and therefore that I think that then speaks to the argument for the food systems approach and I suppose what the point that I would make then around relating to that is we have to understand we're not just simply about trying to develop new technologies and new crops we're trying to develop new systems and that ultimately means change. We have to understand the different relationships and interconnections that are there. We have to understand that we require changes in power. We require changes in mindsets. And then I would argue that we need a much more stronger emphasis on the social sciences in terms of understanding all of that change and facilitating the introduction of new science and technology solutions to the food system then. Yeah, there is an awful lot of education and explaining that's going to have to go on to bring, you know, stakeholders right across the society with us, isn't there? I mean, that's yeah, yeah. one thing that's been coming uh, very clear. Uh, Nora Caldi, talk to us, though, about the brave new world of food production and, and looking at food or food elements in, in, in a different way and using new technology, because we've been hearing so much about, you know, people people's poor diets, how food is making us sick, how people can't, you know, can't afford food. So talk to us about the appliance of science and how that can help and your work in Euratas. Yeah, thank you. So it's incredible. Yeah, food has really become a problem, okay? And, and it shouldn't be because food is really the solution to all this, but um, it hasn't been used the right way. And the realization that we know very little about food and how food interacts with the human body um, is um, was a big thing for myself as an academic initially, um, realizing that, you know, if you take a plant, you have, you're talking about trillions of different molecules within that plant, to understand what molecule does what and how it attracts with the human body is just a huge mathematical problem that currently humans have not really uh, understood. So we're, we're not really close at a few years back, about 10 years ago, we weren't really close to understanding the complexity of food and how we extract health benefits from it. And this is why introducing new technologies to old areas like food and, and, and food production is very important because we live in a data rich world. And the question is how do you use that data and how do you integrate new technologies to decipher that data better and to understand it better? So if I give you a concrete example, 
if you take any source material, let's say a plant, and you eat it, you lose a lot of the health benefits within that plant. So even if you eat it fully, so as a whole foods, you lose a lot of benefits, a lot of health benefits that are in the plant. But when you digest it, you lose a lot of it. You get some nutritional, the nutritional part, but a lot of the very specific health benefits you lose. Also, when that whole foods is processed um, to, to create a finished product, a lot of those health benefits are also destroyed throughout the, the production. So what we did was try and understand, well, how can we identify those incredible health benefits are hidden for hundreds of millions of years in all sources, in all plants around us, in all marine sources, et cetera, and how do we make them available to humans so that we can use food to its full power, we can use plant to its full power, because currently, you know, there's a global clear um, uh, augmentation in the number of people, there's need for more food, but actually we're not using food to its full potential, even what we have currently. Um, so the fundamental understanding of what's in source materials, what are the health benefits there that we're losing as humans, how can we make them more available, how can we take those you know, um, ingredients that you then create and put them into different food sources, into different food products, to improve human health has been really the mission we've been on for a while. Um, so like I said, th there was no way to identify these incredible um, benefits within food without actually realizing, without doing it through computer science. Computer science, And just another example, a more concrete example, let's say you take fava bean, okay? What we discovered recently in fava bean is a network of different molecules short proteins called peptides, so they're short proteins within fava bean, that it, when you eat the fava bean itself, you don't get their power, but the power of these peptides improve muscle health. Now muscle, people don't think about it much, but muscle is the major organ within the human body. It is the organ that we use to, you know, to move. It is our metabolic heart, our energy heart, our, um, it's the first aging part as we sag, that's really to do with muscle aging and the performance of it is very important and it really is key to our health and well-being for a long period of time. So um, what's interesting is that there's currently no real solutions to improve the, the fundamental um, health of, of muscle. And what we did over the past few years is try and identify solutions for muscle in nature. And we found a network, like I said, of peptides, which are short proteins mm -hmm. in fava bean that really tremendously significantly shift the, 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 the muscle from an aging muscle to a healthier, younger muscle. Um, and, and I won't go into more science than that, but basically those benefits would have been lost if you did eat the fava bean on its own. And obviously the fava bean went through a food processing, the same thing would have happened. So in a nutshell, food should be the solution. We're not using it the right way. And the fundamental understanding of what's in food, what's in our, 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 our plants around us, plants and other sources, is really important to be able to structure and create better products, healthier products mm -hmm. with the same taste using new technologies. That's absolutely fascinating stuff. And I wouldn't even have to shell the fava beans to get all the benefits. I could just take you a <laughs> supplement. Uh, besides which, the idea of broad beans being the new Botox, I'm, I'm still kind of getting my head around that. Um, talk to me about the business of trying to, I, I mean, farming insects, we've all, you, you know, we've all heard somewhere, you know, in the future, we'll all be eating insects because they're so nutritious. Most of us don't want to. You decided to go into it as a line of business, but I mean, it's such a fantastic concept. We know it is the future, but what's your practical experience being of trying to get a fly factory off the ground? Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a new industry doing something that's, I suppose, new and innovative is always going to be difficult and challenging. Did people tell you you were nuts? A few, yeah, a few yeah. people did, yeah. Um, I suppose it, when we started, it was really kind of early stage. The industry was only really getting started globally at that stage. Um, so, like, there's, there's been a lot of, there's, there's a lot in the media about insect farming now, and it's, it's, you know, it's received a huge amount of investment since. But when we started, it was very much at the conceptual stage. Uh, even, you know, there had been a lot of scientific research, but as a practical solution, it was still quite early. And come here to me, Alvin, why did you want to go into flies, flies instead of beef, for instance? So, so we were looking at, I suppose, the future population growth is going to be an extra 2.2 2 billion 
by 2050, the demand for protein, not just for the human population, but actually on a more practical level for animals, uh, you know, the, the need of pro for protein to be used in animal feed. And we saw that there was industrial, you know, the, the, the agri sector and, and the industrial sector were predicting that there would be shortages and there would be a gap there in that protein production. So we looked at insects. Insects are really, really high in protein. For example, like the insect we use, black soldier fly, it's, it's got 60% protein. Um, so it, the insects had a two and a half uh, week life cycle, quick turnaround. They were able to take in uh, raw material food waste that we produce, um, that's produced in, in society. And instead of, you know, that being discarded, they can actually turn that. Do they have any favorites? They do, yeah. They, 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 um, certain foods they are, are waste streams they prefer. Stuff of vegetable or vegetal origin is, is quite good. Um, distillery byproduct as well, certain <laughs> grains and <laughs> things like that. There's a surprise. So, so what was the experience? I mean, was there local support? Was there official support? What was your experience? Uh, so it was challenging. So there was obviously there was two elements to it. There was, uh, there was getting the investment in, in the first place. Um, that we were able to do over time. Then there was obviously the legislation side of things as well. So actually when we started the business, uh, there was no legislative framework to, to, to uh, grow or farm insects at all. So we were kind of in this really kind of strange grey area. Gray area. Where um, it was kind of, did you even know it was legal? Uh, well, we, it was, <laughs> see, it was, in, it was in America and we thought, well, what's, what's going on in Europe? Then we realised, look, there was big moves at a European level to, 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 bring, this, uh, you know, to bring this into law uh, for aquaculture and pet food. So we were following those, those developments. But, uh, you know, when we were in Ireland and we were, we were looking for, well, what licence do you even need for this? You know, that type of thing. Um, so that was challenging because there was no framework uh, in place when we started, started to go. Um, but then the European Commission passed a lot of the legislation, it came, you know, and then we were able to work with something. But it was challenging. It took a long time to get, to get, um, uh, to get the approvals we needed. Um, but I suppose there was learnings there on both sides. You know, there was no use case, there was no um, It was a learning precedent. on the official yes, side as well. Yes, it was well. learning on yeah. both sides for, for sure. Um, and there's going to have to be a lot more of that in the years ahead, isn't that right? In all kinds of areas. I, 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 think, I think goals. so. I think yeah. like technology moves at a very quick, you know, very fast pace. Innovation is moving fast. The solutions we need, are, we need them now. Um, so, you know, legislation and regulation um, needs to kind of, there needs to be a matching there of, of how that can, can fit in together from a, a timeline perspective. Obviously, there's commercials yeah. of trying to get things going versus balancing the health and safety and the, you know, the regulation yeah. side of things. Um, but it, it, it has worked out. We're approved and we're, uh, we're growing as a, as a business. And globally, the business is, you know, insect farm is expanding at a rapid rate. So it's, it's a good solution, I think. OK, it's absolutely fascinating stuff and fair play to your innovation. Uh, and Kevin, just talking, uh, actually, before I come to you, I'm going, the question I'm going to give to you is to look for a reaction to our Slido poll, which was which area of research and innovation in agri-food requires the most attention to address key food system challenges by 2030. Uh, was it food authenticity, traceability and safety systems? 13% thought so. Uh, fisheries and aquaculture, only 8%. Uh, healthy and personalised nutrition, 16%. Genetic improvements, only 5%. But nature-based solutions and circular economy approaches were a whopping 58%. Um, what is a circular economy in food production? And how does research and development need to play into that? Can you hear me, yes. Kevin? I can hear you, sorry. I uh, just went blippy there for I'm at home and my internet connection isn't great. Um, so um, it's a big question. What is a circular economy uh, and how can it feed into our food system? Because um, it is one of those big terms that's thrown around. So I thought it would be yeah, useful so, to break it down. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose right now we live in a linear economy. We take something out of the ground, like fossil-based resources, oil, gas, and uh, we convert that into something. That, that something can be fertilizer, actually. Uh, and that fertilizer goes into a field. Um, but it's, it's a, a make, break, throw away society. That's what we have. That is a linear economy. Uh, the circular economy is trying to take our resources and say, okay, let's keep them in the material cycle. Let's keep them in the economy for as long as possible. Let's try to uh, design them so that they can be reused. Let's make them so that 
they can create as much value and as many jobs as possible. Let's create them so that they don't generate a huge amount of waste. Uh, let's create them so that um, we are ultimately reducing the amount of energy that is used to make them or to uh, reuse them. So it's a, it's a holistic view of how we use materials and the impact the use and creation of those materials is having. So a circular economy should ultimately reduce our footprint. It should reduce our impact on the environment while still creating jobs, creating wealth, uh, and, and ultimately contributing to sustainability. And it is the only way we're going to be able to feed more people on this planet without burning it up, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, we absolutely have to think circular uh, in our in our thinking and in, in food production. Someone mentioned it earlier. I think someone mentioned earlier, but um, 30 percent of the food that we are we produce goes to waste. It never gets to be consumed. It's never consumed by human beings. So we have a massive I think Nora said it, you know, that we're not getting the best out of our food. Well, we're not no, not only not getting maybe the interesting molecules that Nora is looking for, but we're also not getting uh, efficiency in our food systems. And I, actually, a lot of that isn't down to agriculture. Agriculture is actually quite efficient at production. It's the supply chains after that. Yeah, and it's our the two for one offer, the three for one offer. Um, in have I stopped? No, we're still hearing you. Go on, Kevin. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no, I, uh, hold that thought then and we'll come I'm back still, to you. I'm still there, sorry. No, but that was a really interesting point you were making, if you still hear me, about the inefficiency in the food systems, if you like, being beyond the farm gate. Yeah, so... Uh, no, we'll see if we can improve that. Can I, just hold there the, the line, Kevin. We'll see if we can uh, sort that out uh, a little bit. Before I'll come back to you on that, Maeve. But before I do, I want to give you another Slido question, which is, research and innovation can make the biggest contribution to achieving a sustainable food system. Do you strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, or disagree or strongly disagree? And th th this is how much we, th this is this question of how much uncomfortable change do we have to make in our own lives and the way we do business now, Maeve, isn't it? Compared with how much will, you know, somebody like Nora come along with a way of using artificial intelligence to get the most out of a fava bean and new products? Sorry, Anya, what's the Just question? on the so balance the, there. The balance of the, the change in the system, is it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I think there's huge potential for change um, all along the system. And we did some work recently looking at the opportunities to add value to co-processing streams in the meat industry. And we found there's about at least 250 potential opportunities there that we can look at um, valorising into the future. But maybe I can come back a little bit as well and, and speak to the point about the role of livestock production yes. in the food system. And um, Chagask is actually organising an independent dialogue around that in parallel with the national dialogues, I suppose, to try and bring a bit of balance to, to, the, to the argument around it. And if, it was interesting our slido pollsters weren't that impressed by genetics as being you know the answer and a lot of farmers are saying we'll be able to breed you know a, a, a herd that will produce much less biomethane and genetics is crucially important to that yeah absolutely well genetics is part of it and then feeding strategies are all part of it as well but i think the point i was trying to make is that we have to look at what our cattle actually doing and you know we have the, the, the point here that insects are converting non-human edible food into feed our food for humans, cattle are actually doing the same thing. So they're converting non-human edible food, grass, into food for humans. And they also have a significant role in terms of eating, uh, you know, distillers, grains and things like that in the past. So they have, a huge they have a huge role there as well. So I think we have to think about the, 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 the role of uh, livestock beyond producing food. They have a role in terms... We had the burn example last week, whereby if you didn't have those cattle wintering, you would have overgrown sc uh, scrubland, you would have a, a negative environmental impacts. We have the significant role that grasslands play with regards to... Um, uh, or the up in, the, in the uplands in Wicklow, for example, there's a grass called Melinia. If that's not grazed, you will have the, the forest fires that you have, the, the, the wildfires that you have at the moment as well. So livestock have a role in all of these ecosystem services. And I think it speaks to your poll also about the, the natural, uh, nature-based solutions that are there. And livestock can be part of that. But it's about trying to figure out mm -hmm. where it fits in the overall food system is something that we need to consider. It's not the tobacco of the, of the, of the industry. It's, it's part of the solution and it's trying to 
to figure out where it fits is where there may be a bit more balanced debate is required. And Alvin, I never asked you, how, what, what do you do with your flies once you've produced them? <laughs> what happens to them then? Yeah, so, so we have our own, um, one part of the, the factory would be uh, the breeding section. So that's where the adult flies uh, mate. So we extract the eggs there. That's in a very temperate, humid uh, climate. Extract the eggs. Um, and then How what hard is it to get an egg out of a fly? Well, you have to have an attractant and get them to, to lay in a specific area. And it is very, very tricky. There's a lot of IP and science uh, behind it, but uh, we've, we've cracked that. Um, so then after that, what, what we do is um, you, we take those eggs and then they're brought to a hatchery. Uh, where they grow out into kind of a juvenile larvae and then they're moved into a bigger incubation room. And at those two stages, they're introduced to um, the feedstock or the food waste. And uh, over the course of about uh, seven to 10 days, they will completely bioconvert that. They will grow in over 2,000 times their size from egg. Um, and then what we do is we separate uh, a certain percentage of the larvae at that stage to go back into the original, uh, you know, into the breeding. Circle so that the of colony, life all colony over again. Keeps, yeah. keeps going. And then the rest, the rest of the larvae then are separated from uh, the feedstock that they've eaten. So they've eaten that feedstock and what's left over is a material called frass, which is an organic fertilizer, which can then, you know, be used locally in, in agriculture or in horticulture. And um, when they have been screened then it, with that sieving process, they're then, they're then processed and separated into oils and proteins. Uh, so the protein is about 60% uh, protein and then the oil is very similar in its composition to coconut oil. Uh, it's almost exactly the same actually. Um, so that's that's kind of the process so I could be of how it works. rubbing myself with fly oil in years to come. Uh, well, look, or it, cooking it, with it, it. it can certainly uh, act as a sustainable uh, replacement for palm oil, uh, which you know, as we know, is is uh, its production leads yeah. to deforestation worldwide. Um, so look, there's there's, there's a whole load, there's a host of environmental benefits associated with, with insect farming. Uh, it's it's a ninety percent reduction in CO two emissions compared to other forms of agriculture, and um, has the ability to con convert the food waste that mm -hmm. we're producing, and it can do that en masse. Ireland produces about one million tonnes of food waste annually. If we were to, if we were to build a much larger uh, insect protein plant in Ireland, we could, we could yeah. convert about 15% of our, all of Ireland's food waste. Um, so there, there's great opportunities there. It's a vertical farming system, so you're growing up as opposed to needing lots of land. There's very little water being used, no antibiotics. And uh, there's, there's, there, it's a zero waste system. So Apart from the fact that I have a big ugly fly as an image in my head, it sounds completely <laughs> virtuous and circular uh, and something that can only, we could only want more of. And Nora, it's interesting, isn't it? How, how good do you think in Ireland we are at embracing the novel, the scientific? Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, food production and food sustainability, and we th think of green Ireland, you know, and you know, green fields and it's all very nature, natural and bucolic as opposed to scientists in laboratories, uh, you know, pressing computer buttons. I think, I think Ireland is doing well. I think, um, I think Ireland is doing well. Globally, it's not the case. You can see this, you know, huge pandemics like diabetes and, and other blood pressure and so forth. And then that is caused again by the types of foods we're eating and our lack of knowledge of how to use food properly and how to consume it properly. And, and also uh, the types of products that are produced. And, and I think, for example, now there's this whole movement from meat into plant-based. And, and that lack of understanding of proper plant-based is scary because a lot of the products are now plant-based products. You look at the labels and you're like, wow, this is really super processed and, and what's healthy about it, you know? And, and, but there's still this connotation of, well, it's plant-based, so it is healthy. It's healthier than meat. And I think that kind of uh, misunderstanding, I think needs to really start being, um, talked about at all levels and I don't think it's talked about enough. And actually, and th that's a really, really important point. Uh, uh, um, certainly, I know th th these are arguments that have gone on in my household where you, where you have people, you know, thinking that they're eating a much greener diet and, you know, half of it's coming in the door uh, in cartons from the supermarket and I'm up the allotment bringing home homegrown vegetables and they won't eat them. So anyhow, that, that's, a, that's a sore point with me. But it does raise that issue of, you know, there's a lot of young people growing up and they're picking up, you know, this is the age of, you know, we can all get information about about everything on our phones, TikTok, Google, whatever. And, but that's not the same as the kind of scientific knowledge and understanding you're talking about. And there's a big disinformation gap sometimes in between, isn't there? 
Yeah, it's going to be, though, because, you know, food and consumers are, are moving towards this knowledge based consumer. OK, together with mobiles, apps, et cetera, we now know more and 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 a lot of it is better integrated and, and technology moves really fast. So I think from a technology perspective, we'll get there really quick where we can scan products and we will know what types of ingredients are in them, if they're healthy or not. I think all that will be very soon available. Um, and food now is also becoming a knowledge-based industry because of that, and it has to become it. Um, and there'll be losers and winners, and I think the losers are going to be the ones that aren't going to follow the trends and 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 just you know rely on marketing, heavy marketing, and ones that are going to really understand that this is coming, that you know adaptation of their of their products with um, with you know ingredients that are going to have support behind them, but have real scientific support that are sustainable, natural, and all the boxes that our consumers are looking for, but also have the scientific support behind them is crucial for now. And, and it, yes, there's this gap that still lies between what is healthy and what is not healthy. And I think governments should play a very important role in educating this. And also, I think this might be... Um, out of nowhere, but if you look, for example, at the differences between Africa, Europe, between South America and the US, it's all, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is how do we extract health benefits that are cost effective, that can be put into food, and that are going to help individuals have nutritional, healthy products and, 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 and stay healthier for as long as possible? Because you don't want, you don't want to, you know, live longer, but actually stay uh, in, in a disease state for most of it so how do you live through nutrition and, and and food because literally it's the one thing you do every single day and and really um at the end of the day it's identifying the right components allowing companies to to take that and on board and develop these products and from a, a government perspective i'm thinking about it like ireland is a small country it could really start this trend um and and be a pioneer in this area where it could get a few food companies to really start developing these types of products because the solutions are there. It's just they haven't been integrated. So, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Point very well made, Nora. Really, I was just drawing a breath. Because there. why Fair not? Yeah. Because the solutions, like literally the ingredients are there. It's just that there is no pressure on food companies, I think, to do so. Now, there is mounting pressure globally, but there's still no pressure for governments to say, okay, well, let's look at this, you know, okay. and... and let's create alternatives that are really healthier as opposed to um, ones that uh, there's a mirage of things around and you feel they're healthier, but they're not really. And Kevin, that, that point about getting, because, you know, picking up on the point you'd made, do we still have Kevin with us? I hope you can hear me at this stage. Or, or, or I hear you. Brilliant. Yeah. Because that point you were making earlier about the inefficiencies being less on the farm and actually more within the food system, Marrying that to that point Nora made there about the need for more of our food companies to become pioneers in this area. And it's really interesting. Final point for you to consider here. Um, our Slido poll uh, strongly agreed, 55%, that research and innovation can make the biggest contribution to achieving a sustainable food system. So how do we get that in our food industry, if you like, beyond the farm gate? So I think, yeah, so I think you're right. Right, the opportunity is huge. I think people tend to uh, play safe. So the food industry is no different. Uh, they know what works for them. Uh, and so driving innovation in large organizations, and we have some very large organizations uh, as food companies, driving innovation can be very difficult because innovation places them at risk. Uh, so, so what we really need to do, once again, I think, no, we're um, still here. But I keep you. talking. Yeah. So what I think, what I think, to drive innovation, you need to start at the educational system. You need to um, at um, at the undergraduate level, at the postgraduate level. You need to design uh, courses that are actually going to teach students about how you can change, uh, how you can be an entrepreneur. I think being an entrepreneur is, um, I think, it's genetic, uh, but you can train people uh, to be better entrepreneurs. Uh, so I think that's really important that we can, the, the next generation, like we in Biorbic are trying to train the next generation of thinkers. That's not easy because sometimes, you know, the old phrase, diamonds are dulled and pe pebbles are shone. And um, so 
uh, to drive innovation, what we need is an educational system that allows people to take risks and actually we're not afraid of failure. And uh, Nora mentioned America there. Uh, the Americans aren't afraid of failure, Europeans are. One of the things that limits innovation in our, in our current ecosystem is our fear of failure. That's a really, really um, interesting point there, isn't it? And also that point um, that was being made, Maeve, about, you know, we have a lot of, you know, very well-known big food companies, but also the education and, and rethinking that has to go on there in terms of innovation and in terms of being maybe, you know, embracing of risk. Absolutely. And I, and I think maybe, you know, Kevin and myself, we've been around a while, but I think even we need to be re-educated as well in terms of how we work together in the scientific community. You know, we, have, we operate a lot in silos. You know, you have the geneticists yeah. and the physicists and the microbiologists and the social scientists, but we all need to, to learn how to work together because unless we do, we're not going to address these grand challenges that we need to address. So we need to educate ourselves as well to, and to learn each other's languages and, and to work together. And to speaking to um, Kevin's point about failure, as well if we're thinking about the food system we don't exactly know how, if we change one thing how it's going to impact on another so we have to because accept so we're, not going to have, we're yeah. not going to have all the answers and we have to accept and to, you know we, we won't have the scientific evidence for all of the actions we're going to take so we have to do these at a small level take the risk and and implement them and learn from mm -hmm. them and, and you know we're not going to have the evidence base for everything we're going to have to take some risks accept some failures learn from them and move on well, you've certainly been willing to do that, Alvin. What would you say the biggest message you would have for, you know, people who are part of this conversation, watching online, talking about the Food Strategy 2030, getting ready for this big UN Systems Conference in September? Um, what are the key things you think we need to take on board? What are the key uh, points you'd make? I, I think... Uh... I think improving the efficiencies uh, from the consumer point of view um, in terms of the food waste, like we produce a million tons of food waste annually per, per annum. That's, that's well, your flies could certainly use some. Well, of, well, yes. Absolutely. Um, I mean, looking at other technologies, you know, improving efficiencies in agriculture, improving uh, the type of ingredients that we use uh, in, in our food systems. Um, and, you know, I think overall lowering the emissions where we can uh, and doing so in, in a practical, uh, sustainable way, both for uh, the farmers and also for, for society as a whole, um, but being willing to look at alternative radical solutions mm -hmm. to problems that don't necessarily look like they're an, an issue now, but are an issue down the line, uh, you know, in the decades to come and will hit us hard if we don't, uh, if we don't try and tackle them. Um, so, you know, bold types of alternatives are needed. Um, so I suppose I would say, you know, generally that we need to be, be very open to looking at what we can uh, do to change things in the, in the years ahead. Boldness, a willingness to embrace risk. And it's back as well. I'll give the final word to you here, Nora. It, it's back as well to that crucial <coughs> need that's going to be needed right across society. Uh, for people to understand all of this better, if all of the different groups, the consumers, the producers, the companies, the researchers, are to be brought along the same road together. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I use an app that my dad actually uses and uh, just to show you where technology is going, you know, and you just scan your, your product in the, in the supermarket and you can go into as much detail as possible. So what it can do, it tells you, well, these are the ingredients and it scores them by color. So it tells you orange is not great. Red is really something you shouldn't be eating. Uh, I mean, every ingredient within the product and then it scores a full product. And some of the products you really associate with being, you know, they're not, they're not that healthy, but they're not bad, are in the red zone. Uh, even for me, I was, I was surprised to realize that, you know, there was a lot of additives and, and, and uh, ingredients that we shouldn't be eating at all, and they should be removed completely. And then what's interesting is that you can compare products. So it will tell you, well, you should be eating this one. Here's a healthier version. And that's where things are going. And it's that full integration of different data sets from different worlds, from, you know, health uh, biology to, um, to ingredients, to research papers, uh, and bringing it down really to a final finished product. Now, uh, you know, these are still at the, at the early level, but these types of technologies are going to very quickly um, grow as they access more and more data and more consumer data. So things are going towards there. So I think it's, it's, it's time now to realize this and, and 
and really make a difference because it's it's not a major leap. It's not like oh, where it's small differences are going to make much better, healthier products. Exactly. And, you know, people have the capacity to absorb all this information. Just look at how much we know about spike proteins on coronavirus at the moment. We can name them all <laughs> off by number and none of us could do that a year ago. Thank you all very much indeed for a really enjoyable panel. And once again, I'd like to thank all of our panellists and co contributors today. And particular thanks to all of you watching for sending us your comments and questions and taking part in our Slido polls.